Okay, well, thanks for being here. I don't know if this is actually working that well. If you can't hear in the back, no, this is just a microphone. Let's put that down. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to talk this loud. Um, I'm Terrell McSweeney, I'm a Federal Trade Commissioner. I'm Joe Calandrino, I'm the Research Director of the Federal Trade Commission's um, OTEC Group, which is their Office of Technology Research and Investigation. I tend to be a little bit of a low talker, so definitely just yell at me if I'm not speaking loud enough for you. Uh, yeah, so do I. So we're, I think the, the title of this talk was originally like, is your internet light on or something like that, but what we wanted to do was really talk a little bit about what the FTC's been doing as it relates to the security of IoT products, um, and then engage in a conversation and answer any questions about um, the kinds of things that we're really looking to partner with the research community on. Uh, I guess we also have to disclaim that we're, we're, we're here speaking in our individual capacities, not on behalf of the FTC, because like that way we get to have a candid conversation about this stuff. Um, so the, the first thing I would say is uh, the Federal Trade Commission is a consumer protection agency. We're 100 years old, um, so what the heck are we doing having a talk at DEF CON about IoT data security? Well, it's a good question. Um, we basically bring cases when we think that uh, consumers are uh, going to be harmed. So we use an authority using uh, the FTC Act to bring cases against unfair, deceptive acts and practices. And what that means in the IoT space is if uh, data security is unreasonable and consumers are harmed, we can bring a case. Um, or if someone is making claims about the security of their product but those aren't accurate claims, those are deceptive claims, we can bring a case. Uh, so we've actually started to bring a number of IoT related cases. We've uh, been studying IoT very carefully. And I think it's probably no surprise to anybody in the room that we found that uh, you know this is a very porous security environment for consumers. Yeah. So you want to say a little bit about why you're here? <laughs> okay. So um, I'm here because I'm a technologist like most of the other people in the room. Um, my background is that I have a doctorate in computer science that's focused on security and privacy. Um, and I've been with the FTC about four months now, so I'm still pretty much a newbie. Um, and I'm part of a new group that's kind of like the research arm of the FTC. Um, our focus is on actually kind of trying to be able to use the, our understanding of technology to help drive the policy of the FTC. So being able to engage with communities like this is of great importance to us. Also, we're still a pretty small group and there's a large amount of things that we need to be able to look into. So we need a lot of help from the people in this room. So uh, one of the things that we've been really working on at the FTC over the last five years especially is uh, really thinking about do we have the resources in-house to be able to con protect consumers in an increasingly interconnected world um, as the, the wave of IoT products sort of washes out into the marketplace and over all of us. Uh, so pretty quickly we realized that one of the key things that we needed to do at the Federal Trade Commission was bring in some expertise uh, in the technology sector in-house, but then also form partnerships um, outside of, in the outside community as well. So Joe's uh, a living and breathing example of bringing a security researcher in-house. Uh, one of the things we also did was start the Office of Technology Research and Investigations. Um, why that's important is that um, we actually are creating in-house our own capabilities of replicating research and determining kind of what's happening with some of these products. Basically, one of the things we need to really find out, and this is also where research partnerships really help us, is how is the technology working? Does it work the way that the company is claiming it works, or does it do something different? And if it's doing something different, that's actually a, a target-rich environment for us as enforcers. Um, so we started, uh, we call it OTEC in-house. Uh, I don't know, am I allowed to say that publicly? I just said, oh well. Um, I like it. So. Uh, and so one of the important pieces of, of OTEC is actually um, making sure that we have people in-house that can help us even translate some of the highly technical work that gets done um, and presented even at conferences like DEF CON because I'm a lawyer, I'm not a computer scientist, and while I'm really interested in the field, uh, there's some things I just don't understand. And so I rely on Joe and the OTEC folks to help me understand how the tech is working or what, what, why the issue is even a significant issue if it's coming in our door. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it really just is important to be able to clarify technical explanations and so on and to have people in-house who are able to call BS on explanations that are provided that just don't actually make any sense in practice. Um, and even just beyond that, having people in-house that can do things like setting up minimum proxy or stuff like that is really important when you're trying to figure out how IoT devices and other devices are actually working in practice. Um, also, I think that just generally having people in-house that have this type of technical expertise is good for keeping us ahead of the curve. I mean, all of us have seen articles before in the news where it talks about some vulnerability in some product, and all of us knew about it like three or four months ago, if not years before. Um, and we want to make sure that as an agency we're staying ahead of the curve on these types of things, and preferably not just a few months ahead of the curve, but seeing what's coming years ahead of, ahead of time. So when we're thinking about bringing an actual enforcement action against uh, an IoT product, say it's something that's vulnerable or it's uh, having some sort of privacy implication that is not clear to consumers or is the opposite of what the company is representing the thing actually does, um, we, uh, we, look for, we look for those cases in a variety of ways. We get them from media reports, we get them from actual complaints that are filed in our complaint database system, and we get them from researchers. One of the things that happens when uh, we see research that's interesting, um, or sometimes people bring it to us, is that then uh, we can engage with it and try to understand it. Now, it's a little bit of a black box, so I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of what that's like when research comes in the door and how we handle it. Sure, absolutely. So even before I joined the FTC, I would actually mentioned issues to them in the past. And it was really interesting actually coming to the FTC and seeing what came of things that I told them. Um, in many cases, it was just kind of like putting something into a black box. I didn't hear much about it. And there's pretty good reasons for a lot of that. We can't just go talking about everything that gets reported to us. Um, like literally, legally. We can't. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's like actual laws. Absolutely. This is where I'd be a lawyer on you. There's there actual laws that prevent us from, uh, from kind of revealing investigations. There's really good reason for that, right? Because sometimes we don't end up bringing a case. Um, and, and if we were revealing information about uh, target companies, then that could really harm them. And if we don't bring a case, then that's confusing for everybody. So uh, we are really strict about what communications can come back out once we open an investigation. Yeah, absolutely. As you're communicating, the investigations are spanned across not necessarily technology, but also privacy. Yes, um, absolutely. So some of our IoT cases um, have been primarily privacy cases, um, especially in the cases of design where TrendNet, where we had cases where um, cameras were being turned on in people's homes without them understanding that those the, the cameras were being turned on, that kind of thing, which is primarily a privacy problem. And then some of them have also been security practices as well. Um, sometimes the security practices are lead to privacy problems as well. Yeah, absolutely. Are you seeing uh, similar bodies outside the U.S. and uh, are you trying to collaborate with them? Yes. Uh, so we actually have agreements with a number of consumer protection enforcers around the world that allow us to cooperate with them through various mechanisms. Um, the FTC has really been a bit ahead of, of really other consumer protection agencies, not just in the US, but around the world, because we've been bringing privacy and data security cases uh, basically for the last 25 years. It started with concerns consumers were having buying things on the World Wide Web, and now has expanded as things are increasingly interconnected in our daily lives. So we've been, we've been doing this work for a really long time, and one of the things that I've really found as I go around the world talking with other enforcers that we work with is that they're very interested in the work that we've been doing and how they can replicate it in their own agencies. And the first thing I tell them is get technologists, find ways to build relationships with them, and bring them into your organization because you need to understand the tech. Yeah, and this is something that we really do want to do. Just over this past summer, we had a safe web fellow from the French Data Protection Authority spend several months with us, and it was a fantastic experience kind of seeing how he was looking at issues and sharing how we look at issues. Any guidance you're providing to the uh, companies or uh, inside the US to how to operate outside? Uh, so we, we do a couple of things. Uh, we provide a huge amount of business education. We're not just an enforcement agency. We have our Start with Security initiative. We put out a guide about our privacy cases. So we put out a lot of uh, business-facing face, information about when we're bringing cases and why we're doing that and what the best practices are that we would like to see industry to adopt. Uh, and then we, we make that publicly available uh, around the world. Um, we, uh, I mean, I think... 
we are we are trying to forge kind of a more collaborative environment. It's I find that a lot of agencies and other places are very new to this work and. Uh, one thing that's really different about the U.S. Uh, system here is that we are we are really in this in this country. We don't have comprehensive privacy laws. We don't have comprehensive data security laws. Now we do have laws. They they're sector. They're based on the kind of information. For example, Graham Leach Bliley for financial information, HIPAA for health information. Uh, but the, it's a very sector based approach. Um, and then we have this generalist consumer protection enforcement authority to protect consumers from all these other things. Um, and many other countries adopt a different model, which is a more regulatory approach at the outset, um, and it's less enforcement based on the back end. So it's, it's sometimes translating an enforcement based approach to these challenges to protect consumers um, into an environment that's more like a regulatory approach. Yeah. There are no, no laws pretty much related to the IoT data, and uh, no privacy laws in the EU which covers the specific data elements of what IoT data is done. So, are you seeing any moment in the EU or China or any other countries? Are so, they going to be without giving to the specific data elements? Yeah, so. You know, California privacy laws, Massachusetts privacy laws, but there are specific data elements in so in the EU, of course, you're probably familiar with the fundamental right of privacy. So usually when I'm in Europe, they say there's no privacy laws in the US, but we have them here because we have a fundamental right. <laughs> uh, but they also have the um, European Data Protection Supervisor putting together a whole privacy framework that will go into place in 2018 in the EU. Um, so some of our conversation is very much about how we're going to facilitate cross-border data flows between the European framework and the US framework, which is why we operate something called Privacy Shield, which I will get into if anybody wants to talk about, but it's super boring about how we move data back and forth. Important, but boring. Um, you know, we've seen uh, Japan, for example, is in the process of updating its approach to privacy. I think Korea is as well. I'm just trying to think of agencies that have um, you know, it's not a conversation we have a lot with China. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there. Um, and uh, and I think that it's certainly, um, when we think of our ASEAN partners, uh, one that we, we're very engaged in um, around Asia. Yeah. And I should also note that this is supposed to be basically an open dialogue. So yeah, so we're means, dialoguing. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> Let's keep dialoguing. Are you interested only in IoT things? No, thank you for the question. So the question is, are you interested only in IoT things or all things? Um, so we're an IoT village, which is why I'm talking a lot about the IoT. Uh, but we actually, um, the bulk of our data security and privacy cases um, deal with probably software and platforms um, more so than, than strictly IoT. But that's just partly a function of the fact that IoT is relatively new, I think. Um, and we have a much longer history of dealing with websites and, and that kind of thing. Um, we are also a, a broad consumer protection enforcer, so um, we work on all kinds of consumer frauds. We also police advertising practices, um, children's privacy online, um, so we handle a whole range of different kinds of issues. Yeah, and you can get some sense for the diversity of issues that we care about, even by virtue of the workshops that we have coming up in the fall. We have ones that relate to ransomware, to drones, to disclosures, which are going to be a big deal on IoT type devices, um, to things like how fraud and other things affect different communities with the changing demographics in this country. Um, smart TVs. Smart TVs. Yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's another right. big one. Um, and we even have a general sort of privacy con that's going to be going on in January that I would encourage people to submit work to. Um, and that also kind of emphasizes why we need the people in this room. For instance, we have people looking into smart TVs and trying to figure out exactly who they're communicating with and what they're communicating. And that can be really tricky when you're dealing with fairly locked down devices where you can't actually see the communication directly. Um, and we need the skills of people. And even if we had a lot of people ourselves with the skills to actually try to figure this out, there are so many different devices out there. And keeping tabs on, any, on everything really does require relationships with quite a few people beyond just our own agency. We've also, this year, we've brought, some, uh, we've brought a routers case um, it, involving the lack of security in routers. I mean, I think that's going to continue to be an, an area of interest for us. Um, we are also looking at fintech issues as well, so it gets a little bit outside of simply privacy issues, but we see 
um, you know, a whole range of different consumer protection related issues um, coming up in a variety of different sectors right now. Any uh, IoT safety cards? Any what, sorry? Any IoT safety cards, like is your area covers with the uh, consumer safety aspect? No, we don't do safety. So we protect consumers uh, sort of generally from frauds and deceptions, from making unauthorized payments, that kind of thing, uh, from advertising fraud. But we actually have a separate commission in the US government that does consumer product safety. Uh, now, of course, as we went through the world of IoT, um, safety becomes a consumer harm. Um, so we can take action when consumers are harmed. And I think that safety is a big dynamic in IoT. So whether or not you can unlock uh, connected locks and invade someone's home uh, really exposes them to, to a certain kind of harm that's a safety-related harm. Car hacking, uh, you know, the security of cars um, exposes people to privacy harms but also safety harms. And, and certainly in that space, um, we're aware of, of these concepts, and for us, it's it's the harm. But we don't test for whether the product is safe. That's the consumer product safety question. Yeah. And there also can be deception issues possibly there too. Like even all the health apps that make certain claims about what they can do, if you can't, if you don't actually have the science to back it up, even though we don't typically get into health quite as much overall, yeah. that would be an area that we might get into. Are there uh, technologists there in the safety board? Who knows what IoT? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The long and short of it is, I, I don't work so closely with the Consumer Product Safety Commission to know exactly how they're handling the technology issues. One of the things that we are really doing with a bunch of the other government regulators that have that kind of overlapping interests. So. Um, you know, if, if DOT and FAA are looking at drones and cars, um, the, the FDA is looking at medical devices, we partner with them when we're thinking about the privacy and data security implications of those products and try to make sure that they have the information that we have about, about how, the, how those products are functioning because some of these older agencies are confronting these issues for really the first time, right? So. Um, the automobile industry, for example, has uh, we have a very long history of an expert regulator that's handling the safety of automobiles, but it has to get very fast now about the safety of the computers that are driving the automobiles, right? Um, and that's like a whole new world. Sorry, there's a bunch of questions. How about in the back first? All right, sorry, I was actually talking to you, sir, in the best. So this is, uh, the question is, can you talk a little bit more about the router case and uh, kind of the expectation around it and maybe what we're hoping to achieve? Do you want to start with it or? Okay, so the router case, I mean, I can give a brief description of yeah. my memory of the case. So I don't actually have it all in my mind. I've only been with the FTC for a fairly short period, so my recollection of all of our cases is still, um, is still growing. But my understanding was that it was a, an ASUS consumer, or ASUS provided routers, or rather ASUS tech. Um, and those routers had in them a number of deficiencies that would enable somebody to be able to access things like um, consumer storage, um, as well as potentially even do things like change sort of the DNS mappings and so on. Um, and those deficiencies had been there for quite a while and people even had reported them um, to the company and the company had not taken any action and didn't have a program in place to be able to respond to those types of reports. Um, so in terms of what actually the standards would be in that case, I would say that those were fairly, yeah, they, fairly clear harms, yeah, I think. They, but so they, they didn't have, I mean, one of the things that really jumped out to me um, as being unreasonable security practice is the fact that they had known, um, you know, widely reported vulnerabilities that were pretty, um, pretty problematic and were very, very slow or didn't respond at all to them. Um, they were also running some, uh, they were adding some offerings to the router package 
um, claiming that they were using the best encryption possible but not properly uh, configuring the encryption, which is a big red flag, I think, as well, when you're making that kind of marketing claim about um, configuring your encryption, like, do it properly, right? Uh, this, is a, this is a theme. We've done this, and we've, we've had a couple of other cases. Um, Fandango comes to mind. Um, there was one other one. Credit Karma. Credit Karma, right? where uh, the uh, security um, certificate verification was like not configured, right? So just, yeah. whoa, that's a but, big problem. Yeah. Um, so so that, was, uh, th that was a big issue as well for me in, in that case. Now, um, as you point out, routers are, are maybe the, the consumer's like gateway into their home network. So protecting them adequately and trying to make sure that we're in an environment where the uh, data security practices of the folks that are making those routers are good is a really big priority for the FTC. Um, and so we've been looking very carefully at some of these different uh, consumer offerings and trying to understand um, some of the problems that we're seeing. I, I mean, I think that's a really good example, the ACES case, of where we um, were watching very carefully some of the research and discussion about the vulnerabilities and taking it really seriously. It takes us a little bit of time to bring a case. So sometimes people get frustrated that we can't bring a case, you know, in six months or something. And I think this time it took us about a year to to do all of that work. Yeah. And even with my, I'm oh, saying. Yeah. So we we actually. Um, we put companies under order, and within the order, they are required to have security programs, to have to notify customers. But you're you're highlighting a thing that I actually think is kind of the next frontier for IoT products um, and consumer protection, which is um, how do we make sure that as a part of protecting all of these products, consumers are getting accurate information about the how long the product is going to survive as a connected product and a secure one, um, and how do we make sure that consumers are getting information if a company breaks its product relatively early. So we actually took a close look at this, for example, I don't know if you followed the Revolve uh, kind of kerfuffle, but basically revolve, uh, nest brick the Revolve product early, I suppose you could say. Um, we have a closing letter. Um, we issue those when uh, we, we decide not to bring a case, but we've looked at something carefully. And in the closing letter, it says, um, you know, this could have been problematic. I'm summarizing, so read the closing letter. It's like, this could have been very problematic. Um, you know, by the time we issued the letter, Nest had refunded customers, and they had a program in place to address the concerns that were raised by the customers. And I think that's the kind of thing that, that you need to think about in the IoT space, um, that, that uh, having a way to make consumers whole when their connected thing is no longer supported, especially if it's no longer supported a lot earlier than what maybe a reasonable consumer could expect, right, um, is going to be a, a consumer protection issue for us. So we're watching that very carefully. Uh, did you ever run into problems like, uh, obviously, back and roll, where you shut down the you know, department, you switch from, you say, transaction one, or other areas, or like, you know, shut them down, but then you think they start to push up? So we don't have great extraterritorial reach, which is too bad. <laughs> um, well, I mean, probably good overall. But um, so we, we, can, we, we can't really. Um, there are other agencies of the government that can can you know um, stop importation of things and have have kind of a policy where they can reach things more broadly in other countries. We we can really only focus on kind of what's happening here in the U.S. Uh, so we don't. I don't think we have probably shut anybody down. Um, we I think I mean, we're aware of the supply chain issue and. Yeah, I mean, we make strong efforts to like freeze assets and do other things such that somebody can't just essentially, somebody who's committing fraud, for instance, can't just basically get shut down and then do the same thing again over. I mean, it can certainly happen, but we are aware of that kind of concern. It's hard. I mean, and we can, we can go after the conduct that's happening in the U.S., but it's hard for us to reach uh, an entity if it's totally offshore. Yeah. Oh, and if it's doing business in the U.S., then we certainly can. It's just finding that nexus. I'm listening to that happening with Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that one's a really tricky area. It's, um, I mean, it's the the game of consumer protection and, and pr protecting consumers from frauds and scams is inherently a whack-a-mole game, unfortunately, because um, one thing we found over a hundred years of consumer protection is that there are bad actors that will find new and exciting ways to exploit people. Um, one of the reasons why the FTC got involved in connected technology products relatively early was they became a way for people to steal consumers' payment information, right? I mean, our early cases are all about making sure consumers like had enough trust in something called the World Wide Web that they would buy something on it, right? Uh, and that's kind of how we got into this business to begin with. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is a really good question, which is sort of when do we bring a case against a company because of its security practices? Am I summarizing that right? Um, and the answer is, the test that we use is whether or not uh, the security practice was reasonable or unreasonable, which turns out to be a very lawyerly thing. So as a lawyer on the panel, I will translate it for you. Um, the bar of reasonable uh, is, to be honest, not an extremely high bar. Um, I kind of sometimes wish it were, were a bit higher. Um, but more or less, what we look for are the security practices by the company. Um, now, breaches and things like that can be really good indications that there was a problem, um, uh, but they're not dispositive of whether we would bring a case. So when we see something, then we start taking a look, which is why having people like Joe is really helpful, and we try to understand, well, what was the company's security process? What were their procedures? We actually have a guide. I'll, I'll do a little, here's a little plug for our Start With Security Guide. Um, it's actually a 10-step guide in plain English that's really designed to communicate with people who are not security experts, but maybe as security experts, it could be very helpful in dealing with them, um, where we talk about, based on the 60 cases we brought, what the best practices are. Some of the problems that we've really seen lately that I think are relatively unreasonable when we start seeing them in this environment is the extent to which you have some sort of vulnerability reporting program, the extent to which you are able to classify those vulnerabilities in terms of their the, the importance of patching them and fixing them, the response time on those, whether you're properly configuring things like encryption if you're using it, um, whether you're training your employees, whether you're keeping passwords in a folder marked passwords in plain text, right? That's actually a case we, we brought. Um, so we're looking for, uh, you know, essentially, I mean, essentially I would say we bring a case when um, a security expert would look at the practice and say, that's ridiculous. How did they let that happen? Yeah. So I mean, basically, like, if there's some flaw in some library that everybody's been using for the past decade and has been looking at carefully and it pops up and it affects a couple different companies' products and everybody, everybody's been using this and has been looking at it carefully and it was just something random, like... I would suspect that we're not necessarily going to go after that particular case. But also, um, one thing that's worth noting is that what's reasonable might actually evolve over time, um, which is part of the reason why we actually are trying to give guidance to companies so that they can figure out what is reasonable even as things evolve. Um, but it's part of the reason also why we need um, people up telling us when norms seem to be evolving based on what they're seeing. Um, and the reason is, I mean, again, I don't have to tell anybody in this room, security is a highly dynamic field. So what best practices are today are a bit different than best practices were five years ago. We don't expect people to have perfect security, but what we're looking for is, is reasonable security and what's reasonable given kind of what we know and where we are in the field. Unfortunately, I mean, I, we also wrote a report and been studying IoT for the last couple of years. I mean, I think what we've seen is that there's just a, a wide range here. Um, some companies with relatively mature security systems and, and concepts and procedures uh, in entering you know, this space, and then some companies that have never thought about it, have been making relatively dumb things, and they're making them connected, and they and they bring them to market, and they still haven't really thought about it. Yeah. That's uh, problematic. Yeah. 
And it's a tricky area too because there are a lot of sort of mom and pop type shops essentially that are creating their own new IoT devices and don't really have as much experience with security. And this is somewhere where, once again, I keep on pointing this back to the people in the room, but people in this room also can play a role in terms of helping to build platforms and so on that help for people that might not necessarily have as much security expertise um, do things correctly. Yeah. question is to do are we are we kind of providing guidance at the enterprise level or in the sort of business to business market right yeah, versus yeah. simply so just a yeah so one of the questions that commonly comes up in the business to business space is how accountable are you for your subcontractors and their security practices and one of the things that I think we've been really clear about is that actually you're, you're going to be fairly accountable for those practices um, so we we the, the security issues for us at the enterprise level um, tend to deal more in that space, I would say. I don't know. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, it also is worth noting that we are consumer focused in the end. So, like, something that doesn't necessarily have an impact on a consumer, yeah. we're a little bit less likely to get directly into. And also, if you're looking for sort of whether we have very specific technical expertise, one thing that I'm reluctant to do would be for us to give very, very low level, like you should have a certain setting in a certain file or use a certain specific language for doing something because, I mean, that would that would be somewhat constraining on business and we're not here to try to stifle what people are doing. Right. So, I mean, I, another way that we say that, um, especially in the policy debate, is we say, look, we, it's important to be tech neutral about the advice we're giving because this is such a dynamic field. So. We're talking about the processes and procedures that we think are the right ones to have, but we're not dictating what kind of tech is the right thing because um, I, you know, I think that's just not our role. Are you providing any consumer side supporting service, or is there any Sure, we, um, so, in terms of consumer side supporting service, um, we run a number of, of websites and put materials together for consumers. Um, the biggest thing that we provide consumers, I think probably is our idtheft.gov website, where we have a one-stop process for remediating identity theft issues. Um, and it's actually tailored with a flow chart so that people can deal with whatever specific identity theft related kind of problem they're having and then get the right information about how to remediate it. And a lot of it's automated to make that an easier process for people. Um, and we put out a lot of consumer-facing blogs and information about different scams and problems and, and issues that, that we're seeing. You know, one thing that we lack, and I, I've actually uh, was really psyched to see Mudge's presentation this morning, is a good way of providing easy, consumer-friendly information about the risk associated with the product or the level of security of it, right? So right now in the marketplace, especially in the IoT marketplace, most consumers don't really have a metric by which they can evaluate whether this baby monitor is more secure than this baby monitor and factor that into their choice when they're buying the product. So one of the things I'd really like to see is, is more and better availability of that kind of thing so that consumers have a chance to literally you know, affect demand based on the security of, of the product as well. Right now, that's very, very opaque to consumers. They have almost no way of knowing how good the security is of a connected product. What about uh, like 911 calls receiving that we don't provide, we, we accept consumer complaint information, but we don't have like a call center that takes the, I mean, we have a call center that takes the complaint, but we don't have like a response. Uh, 
most of the cases, we are pass, pass, passively, you know. So this is a great question. It's um, what is what is the view of, cons of the whether the consumer owns their data, um, and this is actually like a huge topic of debate around the world right now. Um, and it gets really to this core problem of of how how much notice and choice should people have when their data is being kind of consumed taken up um, in different spaces. Uh, you know, in, in the US, for example, you can passively gather information about people. There isn't actually a restriction on that, um, except for children if you're marketing to them, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so that, that would actually require law, a law change, really. Um, but one of the things that we have done when that's happening is um, make sure that if the company is making promises about the kinds of uh, choices they're going to offer consumers that they live up to them. So we have a case um, against a company called Nomi that uh, was um, retailers were using to gather uh, location information about um, people and, uh, you know, just understand where their customers were. But they said, look, we'll, we'll provide an opt-out in the retail location that are using this, which they didn't do. Um, and so we said, look, you can't say you're going to provide an opt-out and notice to people and then not offer it. Um, and so that was that was deception for us. But it's important to note that in the U.S., at least, the, the existence of that technology and the use of it is is not does not require some sort of positive opt-in for the consumers. Um, just like, it's an interesting question. I mean, on the one hand, you want the innovation, you want the smart cities, you want all of the ability to have all of that work really well. Um, and on the other hand, you want consumers to have some control and choice. Yeah. It's a fascinating set of challenges. Yeah. We've also been looking at cross-device tracking. Um, as well, and how that's working for um, because I think that's there's a lot of interesting tech that's about making sure that uh, advertisers can know it's you on a number of platforms, right? And the extent to which um, you know that that how that's operating is a thing that's interesting to us. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're we're like two minutes away. Any last questions? Let's see, I have one and then two. And we'll, I'll do them fast. Can you do anything to operate all devices that are widespread, one design and maybe the other 20 years ago, and for example, payment terminals, where you have your credit card and other people. They're everywhere, but you cannot replace them. Did you, you want to take that one? I'm sorry, I didn't get it clear. So uh, you're talking about um, when there's a widespread vulnerability in something, but it's really hard to replace them. I didn't quite hear the last part. Uh, yes, uh, I'm talking about hardware, about device. There's yeah. a new hardware in the widespread, but they're very old, and you cannot update the software. So you have to replace the whole device to make it safe. What's going to do this year? I mean, I think it would even depend upon what the consumer's expectation was of the product at that point. Like, if you have, like, a device that's... If you have a 30-year-old device in your home and you find out that it has in it insecure, or that essentially the firmware in it was insecure or something else like that, um, it would be challenging actually to figure out exactly what the right thing would be to do in that case in particular. Um, because the company might not even be around anymore. This is part of the reason why I think it is actually useful where at the time when a consumer potentially is purchasing a product to have some idea about what what they can expect in terms of support and so on going on from the product. So at the time when I purchase a product, I know that maybe 10 years from now, this product might uh, might just be essentially bricked or I will need to get rid of it and patches will no longer be provided. But essentially, the more that the consumer knows, the less likely that we are to get into a position like that. Sorry, and you had a question, then we'll wrap up. So you mentioned vulnerability reporting programs. Uh, so is that pretty important as far as if an IoT company doesn't have that? Is that something that's I I would put it right up there on like my top five like good security hygiene practices right some mechanism I mean I'm not saying everybody has to have a bounty program although I think they're awesome 
um, because crowdsourcing is a really good thing to do. But having some mechanism to get the reports in and then respond to them is sort of basic and it's really important. I don't know. You yeah, I mean, if. <laughs> So, I mean, I could imagine there being like a fairly new, for instance, website or something else where they just have some general contact information. But if somebody says, listen, your site's leaking, social security number is left and right or something else, and you contact that email address, I would expect there to be some sort of a prompt response. So there should at least be some way of getting in touch if there's something wrong with your product. Um, and I think that with IoT devices, it seems it seems pretty reasonable to me to expect that there's some way of getting in touch, especially if you're dealing with things that are sensitive enough that somebody might need to get in touch with you quickly. So thanks a lot for coming to our talk. We're happy to continue to answer any questions uh, that remain. Um, again, if I can make a, a one big pitch, it would be um, we have an open door policy. We're really interested to hear what's happening out there. Uh, we also are actually completely happy to answer questions um, and do so all the time from uh, businesses that are trying to do the right thing. So um, our staff is awesome. They are um, accessible. Uh, we could have put up a slide, I guess. I'm on Twitter, at Team McSweeney FTC. You're I'm in plain text. Oh. At in plain text, yep. right? Um, we also have a, an email address. Is it research at yep. ftc.gov? Research at ftc.gov. I actually read the things that come to that email address, so send your good research, but uh, maybe not too much of it. But that, <laughs> re oh, yes, research. Research, just singular, at ftc.gov. Yeah, and we will make an effort, like even in the case I mentioned earlier where I reported things and I, it appeared to be going into a black box. People actually behind the scenes were really looking into those issues I found out when I got there, like really, really looking into them. Um, so we do care when we hear about things through whatever avenue you choose to contact us. And sometimes, uh, you know, the resolution of them is that we open an investigation, we go look very carefully, uh, we decide we don't have enough to bring a case, but in the meantime, the fact that we've opened the investigation and, and the company is having to look at itself very carefully through that process actually effectuates change as well. So um, sometimes if, if the research doesn't end up in an actual case, then it may very well influence our ability to open the investigation, which may in turn, result in really good changes for consumers, which is everybody's goal. So. All right, well, thanks very much. Appreciate your time.